The NCAA is officially increasing the number of scholarships from 85 to 105, but at the same time, lowering the roster size. So if you're the parent of a high school football player trying to earn a college football scholarship, but worried about the portal, NIL, and these huge new NCAA rules that are coming to a theater near you next year, then this video is for you. I'm gonna show you how this settlement actually opens up new paths for you to get a football scholarship and why now is the time to seize that opportunity. So while other parents won't understand the rules and how to use them to their advantage, you'll be able to attack the process differently and give yourself an unfair advantage. Now, if you don't know who I am, my name is Richie Contratesi. I'm the founder of Next Play, and I specialize in transforming driven varsity football players into confident businessmen, where 83% of our athletes earn college football scholarships and 42% go Division I. And I make these videos because I understand the struggle firsthand. At just 5'7 and 150 pounds, I secured a D1 football scholarship in the SEC at Ole Miss, and now I wanna share my journey and the lessons I learned with you so you can live your dream as well. Let's jump right into it. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share with you the facts of this case, as well as how this will affect you as a parent or a player, and what you can do to take full advantage of it. Just know that this is always going to be changing. So if I say something now and then a ruling changes later, and also just to be clear, this is the facts right now. So if things change later down the road, then we'll go and have to make a new video. But this is where things stand now and what you can do as a result of that. Just like in life, things are ever changing, we have to adapt and adjust. So here's some background info. The House versus NCAA settlement currently valued at 2.8 billion is under review as the NCAA and Power Five conferences face scrutiny over the language related to booster payments and revenue sharing. The settlement would cap revenue sharing at 22% of school revenues, replacing external NIL payments with school distributed funds. However, Judge Claudia Watkins raised concerns about enfor enforcing booster restrictions and how it might impact athletes' earnings. The House's most recent response, we are perfectly fine with those changes. It's now up to the NCAA. So the House versus NCAA settlement, there's a lot that goes into this settlement, which is mainly about how we're paying players through the NIL and now the ability for the school to have to be able to pay the players and there's gonna be a cap on that. I'm not gonna be discussing that in this video. Instead, what I really wanna focus on is the bigger picture for scholarships for you right now, which is, the fact that they increased the scholarships but lowered the roster size. So that's really what I, what I want to dive into. And the other stuff, the NIL, they're how they're paying players, we're going to make a different video on. So the most important, not most important, but the first fact I want to talk about here is expanded scholarships and roster caps. So football scholarship limit increases from 85 to 105. All right. So Division One programs had 85 scholarships. Now they can have up to 105. The key word there is up to 105. Not every school, especially some of the smaller schools, which I'll dive into in a little bit, are gonna use all of those scholarships. So right now you can have up to 120 players. 105 players can go into camp. So essentially you have 85 players on scholarship and then the rest are walk-ons, up to 105 so go into camp. When the season starts, we increase that roster size to 120, right? So now you're going to have 20, 50, 35 walk-ons and 85 scholarships. This is how it's always been. This is what it's been. Now it's going to be 105 scholarships and the team's going to be capped at 105 players. All right. So the question is, well, oh my gosh, what's gonna happen to walk-ons? It's crazy. So a couple things to think about. The way that you target schools is gonna be a little bit differently, right? Like if you're a division two, a solid division two, FCS potential, and then you would try to walk in at a G5, you're probably not gonna do that anymore because they're not gonna have the walk-on opportunities. Some of the G5s will, but again, this is gonna, you're gonna have to adjust your strategy because they're just like, all the power four programs, none of them are going to have walk-ons. So, let, let, let's look at a Clemson, for example. They don't use the portal at all. 
So they might say, hey, we don't want 105 scholarship players because there's gonna to be too much competition and everyone's gonna transfer out. So we want the walk-ons. So it's, it's, it's kind of crazy. It's gonna be based on coaches' opinions, really. I know it kind of sounds crazy, but something to think about. Number two, the impact that this is gonna have on the smaller programs, right? Larger programs will benefit more from the scholarship increase this is gonna create more separations from Power 4 and G5 programs. So I've been saying this for a while, I think college football is going to create, like a, it's gonna almost end up being like a minor league for the NFL, where just like in baseball, you have A, double A, triple A, I feel like it's, we're already kind of moving in that direction. Because in division one, we already have Power 4, G5 and FCS, and then you have division two, NAI, JUCO, division three, right? So the larger programs are gonna benefit. It's just gonna create more separations from power four and G5 because it's all gonna be predicated on money. Do you have the money to fund the 105 scholarships, right? And smaller programs might attract better players who don't want to walk on elsewhere, right? So that is a possibility, but we'll just have to see. You know, you may wanna consider smaller programs where scholarships are available, but rosters may be less crowded, okay? Number three, big, NIL as scholarships and roster flexibility, right? Schools will no longer be able to use NIL money as scholarships because the roster cap size still apply. So what do I mean by that? So schools right now are literally using NIL to cover scholarships. So for example, let's say a school has hit 85 scholarships, but they wanna bring on a player who's a scholarship caliber player but they don't have the scholarship available. What they're gonna do is raise the funds at NAL and they're gonna pay that player the amount of money they would need that would equal the scholarship. With the NIL, now that it's gonna be through the school and you're only gonna have 105 people on the roster with 105 scholarships, that option is no longer gonna be on the table. So some coaches like you know that are taking advantage of that are going to lose that. So that's a big thing. Here's my opinion on this, and I think it's scary for the players, but it's a reality. I believe that coaches, there's no roster cap in the preseason. So you can bring on you know, NIL players essentially and pay them through your collective. And then when school starts and the season begins, cut them, which is crazy but think that may happen, all right? So if you're a player and you're thinking about going to school and you're not on scholarship, there's a possibility you could get cut and then you can't transfer out until December or when the portal opens again, unless this goes down and then the NCAA comes out and literally just says like, hey, we're going to keep the portal open. I, I just don't see that happening, but this is crazy right? This is absolutely nuts. You know, all the power went back to the players and there's a possibility that some of this power could go back to the coaches. So pretty interesting and we'll see what happens there. Number four, increased transfer activity. More scholarship players may lead to competition for playing time. Transfers could increase due to roster overcrowding. 85 scholarships. You only got 22 starters, right? Not including special teams. So these 105 scholarships, you know, who are they gonna go to? The third string guys that's that, like, that that could be starting at the G5 level, or if you're a power four at the G5 or the G5 at the FCS or FCS division two, like that, that muddies the water a little bit. Overcrowding is a real thing. And uh, we're gonna have to see what happens there because there's 105 guys in scholarships. There's only 22 starting positions this could be a real challenge <laughs> to keep players and to keep them happy. My suggestion for you is ensure you're committing to a program that values your development, right? Is it, you know, I heard Tom Brady say this and he talked about this quite a bit extensively, which is you're going now to a school to play football. Whereas before you were entering into a program where you were gonna develop over three to five years. Right now you're just going to play on a team. There's football teams is what he said. And I agree on that. Um, I think this overcrowding is gonna create a lot of transfer activity. So my suggestion is committing to a program and, and doing research that value your development and then really monitor transfer trends. Fact number five, and let's talk about the walk-on impact. 
So larger rosters could lead to dissatisfaction among players who don't get playing time. Walk-on opportunities will be reduced and in some cases completely non-existent with some TV teams having no walk-ons because they use all, all 105. So this is a real thing, right? Some teams will literally have zero walk-ons. So that's a real thing. And I would assume that's probably gonna happen at every major power five program and at some G5 programs as well. So, you know, something to think about, make sure you're prioritizing programs with clear pathways, make sure you're targeting schools that actually fit with where you're at right now and you're as a player. And, you know, just shameless plug here, we do full evaluations for players where we can determine, we review your film, review your size, review your academics, we review your physical attributes, and we'll determine, are you D1, uh, Power 4, uh, G5, FCS, D2, NAI, JUCO, D3, we'll let you know where you're at right now, and more importantly, what you need to do in order to get to the next level so you can continue to improve and play at a higher level. So if you haven't had one of those one of those before, I'll leave a link below where you could see if your son meets the criteria to actually get an evaluation. And if he does, you can grab one. Cause at this point, like if you don't know that information and you're just basing it off of a coach that said you your son's a division one player, like first of all, there's three tiers of that. Second of all, I would get evaluations done by directors of player personnel and recruiting at big time programs who have 10 plus years of experience and we have that on our staff. So if you have that, that's what I would do. So prioritize programs with clear development pathways, avoid schools where roster overcrowding could limit playing time, right? Like this is a real thing and I want you to be prepared for that. So these are all really important things to be aware of through the recruiting process. We'll continue to keep a very close eye on this house versus NCAA settlement. These are facts that have been released that are in the settlement. It's really in the NCAA hands and more than likely they are gonna move forward with them and they're gonna go into effect next year. So if you got value from this video and you wanna watch more videos like it, just make sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification. And if you wanna watch a video where I break down exactly what you need to do in the recruiting process, all the way from eighth grade, freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior, what you need to do at each step in the recruiting process to give yourself the most opportunities at getting college football scholarships, then you're gonna to wanna to watch this video right here.